so we just aspire set ourselves up with a little aspiration we're going to listen to these teachings of the Buddha and that includes me even though I'm saying it believe me I'm listening so that we can take some tools from it to help us develop our amazing potential so we can help others that's the essence of it really so let's look at the kind of logic of that in the teachings Sange chetang soke chognam la jang chu padu dagni kyab su chi dagi chenyen gi pe sonam ki dro la penche sange drupa shok sange chetang soke chognam la jang chu padu dagni kyab su chi dagi chenyen gi pe sonam ki Drola penche sange drupa shok sange chadang soke chognam la jang chu badu dagni kyab su chi dagi chenyen gi pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa shok Do we need that fan? Huh? It's not meant to be an instruction, it's a question. Just try it off and see how we go. And then we need it, we can turn it on. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Well, every, every word of Buddha's teachings is said to be coming from Buddha's experience. So that's why we should really check up where we get the teachings from, what books we read, what centers we go to, because just because a person says they're Buddhist doesn't mean that they're being valid. And that's really important, you know. We should use our own intelligence to check that what you're going to hear is coming from a valid source, you know. And you get some confidence when you hear it. So the fact is, if the teachings are valid, that means they're coming from Buddha's experience. Even though it might be coming via Tibet or coming via Japan or via Thailand or via Australia, it doesn't matter. As long as the person, you know, is, is, um, is speaking authentic teachings, and that's what we have to check, and it's not necessarily easy to check, then we can have some confidence. But if the teachings are valid Buddhism, they necessarily are coming from this person Core Buddha, who lived two and a half thousand years ago, from his own direct experience. It is, Buddhism is not revelation. It is not mystical. I mean, it is, but it's understandable. It's not a belief system. It's not, you know, something you can't understand. There's every single syllable of Buddha's teachings. They have to be able to be cognized and proved to be true by the individual practitioner. Of course, one step at a time. You can't prove it all at once, obviously. That's what practice is. Practice is the gradual process of two things. Experiencing it for yourself and verifying it as true. That's the process and that's what we have to do. And that's the way to, to approach this stuff, you know. So essentially what Buddha's saying, in very simple terms, the simplest terms, what he's saying is every single mind, every mind possessor, and this term in Tibetan, that we translate as sentient being, Sem Chen, every mind possessor, so we're one of them, possesses this natural, natural potential, natural potential, to develop the goodness and get rid of the badness. It's the simplest way of putting it, and the, without any kind of moralistic overtones. When we can hear it this way, it's kind of, it gives us confidence, you know. And this is Buddha's findings are, ah, as we were talking last night, it's shocking to us when we think of this in, in materialist psychological terms. Buddha's actually saying that he has found from his own direct experience that things that we all know upside down and back to front 
called ego, anger, fears, attachment, depression, jealousy, low self-esteem, that the ones that we are all familiar with that are in the front of our mind about ourself every minute, that this stuff, as they say in Buddhist psychology, and you need your, diction you need your dictionary for this because I don't use this word in my daily life, that they are adventitious. They are not at the core of our being. So just hearing that and then attempting to hear the logic of it can, be, can give us great confidence. Then we do the work. And of course it takes time. To have, in other words, to have confidence that a certain recipe is valid, to have confidence that a theory is valid, gives you great, is enormous for our, we need that. And then we start to apply it and slowly get the experience of it. But you've got to start with that. You've got to start somewhere. It's like saying you have a map that goes somewhere. It, it might be, um, be 10,000 miles away, the end result of that map. But once you've got a map, you, have so, you can calm down. Even if it's 10,000 miles, you know, the map, you know, the Buddhist view, that this is the way the Tibetans package it, there's this map, you know, and the goal is what they call Buddhahood. The long-term accomplishment of what I just said before, the ridding of the badness and the getting of the goodness. The word, in fact, in Tibetan, sangye, the, the, you know, the etymology of that, of the words of the Sanskrit word Buddha, sang implies the utter eradication from our mind, our consciousness, of all the neuroses, ego and all the voices of ego, attachment, anger, pride, jealousy, this stuff, so simple, so profound, so outrageous. And the second syllable, ye, implies the, t the development to perfection literally perfection of all the goodness love compassion wisdom joy blah 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 you name it these simple words are not complex this is what buddha is saying this is what he has found from his own experience so having then the, the you know buddha's methodology is just the map that he has presented the tibetans have presented it very nicely they're really good at structure you know then once you've got a map even as i said if it's ten thousand miles away even you have to crawl there once you've got a map, you know you're going in the right direction. Then you can relax. But our trouble is we tend to think there's no map. We tend to think there's no cause of anything. There's no reason why this happens. It's just good luck and bad luck. No one knows why you're born. No one knows what the purpose of life is. No one knows the cause of happiness. No one knows the cause of suffering. And no one knows where we're going. I mean, no wonder we're all having total mental breakdowns every day. That's what we believe is true. We think that's scientific truth. We say, oh, nobody knows, as if it's a scientific truth. No wonder we're full of panic every day. It's not surprising we're all going crazy, killing ourselves and killing each other. If you, have, if you live your view like that, which is the materialist view, with respect to us. So, Buddha says it's all knowable, it's all doable, and guess what? We do it. We're the one who's done it. We, are, we caused it, and we will cause it whatever it is. So he lays out what he has done and says where we can go from a direct human experience. So if he's a human being and he did it, the logical, the logical deduction is that I'm a human being and I can do it. Well, from this you get confidence, theoretical confidence, even theoretical, or confidence from knowing the theory. One step, then it's one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, that's it. And from confidence can come from that, but that's what takes us time, because instinctively, Instinctively, we believe it's not knowable. We believe no one knows. We believe because we can't see it. That's why we have so much panic and drama, you know. Even if the journey is a mile long, but you're lost, you don't have a map, that's, that's why we have fear. You're going around in circles. You don't know where you are, you don't know where you've come from, and you don't know where you're going. That's what fear is, and that's how we live our lives. Whereas if you have a map and you, every, every step of the way you know where you've come from, you know where you are and you know where you're going, that's what causes us to calm down. So if it's true, as Buddha is suggesting, that delusions are adventitious, I mean this is a shocking, outrageous, radical statement to hear it really clearly in the way he's meaning it, not in nice mystical holy terms then we really need to understand it, you know, and get some confidence in it. As I said, the mind is Buddha's expertise. It's what he deals with. That's what he's an expert in. That's what he knows profoundly and deeply and not in the way we talk in the West. I'm not insulting our systems. I'm just saying it's very different. 
You ask the, one of these great yogis who's been living for years and years understanding, investigating, unpacking, unraveling and reconstructing their mind in, you know, into, in, uh, to be in sync with truth and reality and virtue, which is what Buddha says. You ask them where their brain is, they would never have heard of such a thing. They've no idea, but they definitely know their minds. So the crucial thing about knowing your mind in Buddhism, of course, is an internal process by definition. It does not need a microscope. It needs a lot of, inner, a lot of discipline, a lot of confidence, a lot of patience and humility to know your own mind. And there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut, you know, you've got to know your own mind. But before you even do that, as we know in the Buddhist structure of all the teachings, they call it in Tibetan Lam Rim, but there's this 14th century arcane concept translated as gradual path. Well, I mean, who talks like that? We don't. But you call it a course, which is the term we would use in the modern day, then we suddenly get it. The Lam Rim means a course, and the course is a course that takes you to the end result called Buddhahood, grade one, grade two, and you graduate as a Buddha. It's a course. To Buddhahood. So the very first level of that practice, as they say in Tibetan, as Lama Zobramshe very correctly translates it according to the lineage of his lamas, you know, it's the teachings that are appropriate for the person of the lowest capability. And the second level of practice, the middle scope of practice, they call it, the teachings and practices suitable for those of the middle capability. And then the, the, the third level of practice, known as the great scope, are the teachings and practices suitable for those of the greatest capability. Well, I would rather call it junior school, high school and university. His Holiness often says that. It's like the education system. Because we get that so strongly in our culture. The structure of a course. We know it's uh, the, the simple stuff first and you, you grow, go towards the most advanced. That's how we internalise any body of knowledge at all. It's just that we don't think of spiritual like that. Well, for the Buddha it's the same. Cooking, violin playing or becoming a Buddha. Same process gradual so junior school the Buddha doesn't even deal with his mind the mind yet he says it's too advanced we've got to control you've got to do what your grandmother says behave nicely junior school level of Buddhist practice is behaving nicely but this already is profound this already is profound that we can understand Buddha's view of morality but as soon as we hear words like that, we kind of think it's a dirty word. That just sounds like religion and we get nervous, you know. The Buddha's fundamental one way of framing all the Buddha's teachings is a practice of morality. Another way of framing all the Buddha's teachings is it's a method for getting happy. Another way of saying it is a method for stopping suffering. Another way of saying it is it's a method for getting to seeing the reality, to seeing truth, developing wisdom. They all come to the same thing. So why do we have to control our behavior? Why do we have to behave nicely? Why? And that's a really good question. When Buddha says, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal, your first question should be, why not, mate? <laughs> you should ask that question, and there should be a logical answer. So if you're a Christian, this is a, huge, this is a massive point, actually. We don't, un we don't unpack this stuff, which is what we should do. I was a Catholic, okay? That means... I had faith in God. God is a, a superior being above and beyond me, necessarily, who isn't caused, who is permanently that, who doesn't change, who wasn't ordinary and then became perfect. That's a shocking concept in Christianity, for example. God is innately perfect, has always been, and there's no cause of it. And of course, God, by definition, is the source of me, the laws of morality, and everything else. So naturally, that means God is the boss. And that naturally means I have to do what God says. Naturally, obviously, of course. That's just natural. And that's our view of morality. So I always quote this, always quote this. Very helpful. I've got this Jesuit priest friend. And I asked him, by definition, what is a sin? By definition, a sin, he said, is doing what God said you shouldn't do. Now that's exactly how we think. That's the, Buddha would say that's the dualistic view of morality that we have that he would say is neurotic and not being rude if you have faith in God. Please have faith in God. That's what we think in our mother's house. If my mother said to me, don't do that, and I naturally, being smarty pants, will say, why not? And we all know her answer. Because I say so. 
That's what defines goodness and badness in our culture. The, you know, the, the judge, the police, the law, they out there somewhere impose upon us a whole series of instructions. That's why we get guilt. That's why we have shame. That's why we try to get away with doing naughty things because no, they didn't see me do it. That's why we desperate like junkies to be praised for doing good things. Mummy, I did what you said. Please praise me and reward me. And we're very sad if she doesn't because that's our view of morality. Buddha questions that and that's his fundamental question. He says that's a dualistic and he would say it's neurotic. And that's where attachment to reputation comes in. We're all needy to be seen as a good girl. And of course we are desperate to hide when we're naughty girl. Oh, I got away with it, we'll say. That'd be ridiculous, Buddha says. It's a huge point, this. So that's the view we already have. And don't blame your Catholic or your Jewish mother for it. You got born with it. You did it. It's yours. It's the actual one of the uh, consequences of having these delusions in the mind, in particularly the root delusion that Buddha calls rigpa, unawareness, ego grasping, which we'll talk about, the root problem of all, deep in the bones of our being. It's one of the consequences of this, neuros this neurosis. So it's just natural. So we have to understand it. So his view of morality, he says the same as Jesus or your grandma, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal. But uh, for a very different reason. Not because he says so. Nothing to do with him. He's a messenger. This is a really massive point. And it's the basis of all Buddhist teachings on what's called karma, the laws of morality. Morality for the Buddha has got nothing to do with the fact that he says it. He says it's a natural law. It's a conventional truth. You can prove it. Do some research in this room. Do you like being lied to, stolen from, killed, bad-mouthed? The answer is no. You look at the dogs and the ants, you can deduce they're the same from their behavior. Do you like being ki people kind to you, loving you, giving you things, respecting you? Yes. Well, Buddha says, join the club, darling, it's called samsara. That's how we all are. We all want happiness and don't want suffering. You take that as a given and it's a natural law. No one made it like that. That's what Buddha means by natural law. For him, all of the stuff that he has found to be so is a natural law. He did not make it up. It's not imposed. It's not invented by him and then dumped on us, which is how we feel about morality. That's why we're so neurotic. So he says, killing is a negative action because it harms others. That's the natural law. And you can deduce that by doing your survey. That's what makes it a negative action. At the first, most basic level, he gets us to back off and don't harm others. But we got then, but the, the point is this, an extra component. And this is a huge point. This takes us a while to get in touch with. We discussed it last night. He would call killing a negative action because it harms another. But he says, don't first, first level, junior school, don't kill Rabina because guess what, honey? It'll harm you. This we can't see. This we don't think in our culture. Vaguely we do. Vaguely. But we don't really look at the logic of it. And this is what Buddha says. Because he says everything is knowable. By definition, that which exists is knowable by mind. You're a mind possessor, so your mind can cognize it. This is Buddha's deal. So we have to learn to go through the process of understanding it logically. And if it's not logical, it doesn't exist, he says. This is a fact for the Buddha. A fact. Everything that exists is knowable. That's finally the, the, the consequence of practice and the, the result of becoming a Buddha, where you've perfected the goodness and rid the mind of the badness, this etymology of the term Sangye, Buddha in Sanskrit, uh, Tibetan, the co one of the, the, the qualities of the mind of a person who is a Buddha, and Buddhahood is achievable by all minds by definition, is the term omniscience. Well, my Catholic mum was shocked. Well, that's what Buddha is saying. But by definition, mind can cognize that which exists. And that which exists can be cognized by mind. This is what Buddha says. So, everything we're discussing in Buddhism can be cognized eventually. You have to start off having confidence in it because you can't cognize it immediately, but you go towards it. 
with the assumption you can cognize it. And then the experience of it is the verification of it, one step at a time. And as Dalai Lama says, if you get to the point where you actually can prove that Buddha is wrong, then you must reject him. So the onus is on us, you know. So, uh, an action of a negative action is one that's called is one that harms another. Th the first grossest level, but the crucial point in the beginning when you do junior school level, where you back off basically. Buddha's saying back off, Rabina, and don't harm others. First level, junior school practice. Why? So we have to unpack them. Why? Because Rabina, it'll harm you. Why you ask? Why will it harm me? Show me the logic. Okay, we've got to talk theories here. You can't prove the logic of a theory until you have first the theory. So we unpack. This is so important to do, otherwise we just, we just transfer from being a little neurotic Jewish or Catholic girl to become a little neurotic Buddhist, bringing the same emotional junk to it. Or the same neurotic little Western materialist, all driven by guilt. And I'm not blaming God here, I love my Catholic upbringing. We've got to unpack it and understand it logically. So, let's look at it. Why logically, according to Buddha's explanations of the universe, would my killing a mouse in my kitchen harm me? How come? And this is what Buddha means by the law of karma, which is a fundamental, a fundamental of Buddhism. Many Buddhists don't even talk about karma. They're embarrassed. Most Buddhists just talk about karma, Buddhism as being mindfulness, being a nice person, you know. You don't need Buddha to tell you that. A good communist can teach you that. Don't waste your time going to Buddha. A good therapist can tell you that, a good Catholic can tell you that. That's something unique. If you don't understand karma, you, you don't have to be a full-fledged Buddhist. You can be a 1% Buddhist. But if you want the whole Buddhist deal, you've got to bring in karma, you know. It's Buddha's, it's, it's Buddha's explanation of the universe. Buddhism actually, from the big picture point of view, is, is, uh, is, is a worldview. It's an entire coherent worldview. Coherent within itself, of course. Not coherent if you compare it with Western science. You know, it's like a load of rubbish if you compare it with Western science. Or it's a load of rubbish if you compare it with Christianity. So you've got to have it, you've got, it's got to be in its own context, you know, within its own understanding of the definitions and terms, etc., etc. It's coherent. It, if, it's a valid, if it's a valid system, it needs to be coherent. And that's what we have to check up on and get confidence in using our noggins. Okay, so what is it about a, an action of killing another that will cause harm to me? How come? How come? Well, in order in, for any action we do, the, uh, action, the word action is actually translated as the word karma. Any action we do, like keep it simple, the action of killing the mouse in my kitchen, for, in order for it to be what they call a complete action, and in all the teachings, in the literature about karma, it's intensely complex how they go into it. The, you know, the fine detail, the commentary, the discussions about it, the workings of karma, the law of karma, a natural law, Buddha says, like gravity, like botany. He did not make it up. He has observed it. This is Buddha's deal. So, okay, in, in, in this action, in order for the action of killing a mouse to be what, for Rabina, to sow a seed in the mind that will bring the fully ripened result and the fully ripened result of any seed in my mind would be called a type of rebirth. As we know, Buddha's view of karma, he asserts consciousness is a continuity of mental moments that's created by itself, by the actions that happen in that mind, that then sow seeds in the mind that will ripen in the future. And one of the ways these seeds will ripen, and this is the part that seems so unevident to us, which is why you have to have the theory first, is a type of rebirth. So the Buddha's view for us, in this case, us sitting in this room, you know, human beings. We can deduce that not long before we stopped breathing in, the past, in a past life, which is not more than a few weeks before we zapped into our mummy's human womb, which would be the time of conception, which is when the egg and sperm came together, a at the time of before we stopped breathing in the past life, a, a very strong seed of morality planted in my mind. This is the only analogy that they like to use a lot, seeds and fruits, you know. That every, and every Buddha's saying every millisecond of what we think and do and say, we are creating karma, sowing seeds, starting with the thought. The best way to translate the word karma, actually the most tasty, is the term intention. It's the mind, the mind. Karma first is done by the mind. Karma plays out in the mind. 
Mind is everything. Karma is the law that determines what goes on in minds every millisecond. This is Buddha's deal. This is Buddha's observation. So there's a mouse in so, there's a mouse in Rabina's kitchen. So in order for the action of killing that mouse for me to be what's called a complete action, there have to be four things in place. There has to be the object, which is called a living mouse, number one. Number two, it's called intention, but there's two A, B, and C. And intention indicates the, the presence of my mind involved in this action. So the two A is, there has to be a state of mind called recognition or discrimination. It's happening every millisecond in every being's mind. And it's a constant ability to, to, to distinguish that's that, that's yellow, that's red, that's pink, that's square, that's round, that's good, that's bad. Every millisecond, we all need this to even be a sane person to function. Whether you're a good person or a bad person, you've got to have this particular one working well. So in this case, there has to be recognition. It's that mouse. I have to see it, that mouse. 2B is intention, the thought, the bare bones thought, not intention meaning motivation. I will kill that mouse. The third one is, two, two, no, sorry, 2C is a crucial piece now, motivation, reason, reason for intending to kill the mouse. And as we see in the world, most reasons are negative. You don't kill a mouse out of, you know, you don't kill a mouse out of love. Sometimes we might. Thinking will stop its suffering. But the crucial point is here is the motivation. And this would be called aversion. How disgusting, a mouse in my kitchen. And what is aversion? Like we talked last night, thwarted attachment. I'm attached to a mouse-free kitchen. Then four, three, I will do the action. And four, result, dead mouse before me. So simply, and everything we think and do and say, we can unpack and unravel it like this. But everything works so quickly in our mind and 99% of what we do is on autopilot. It's instinctive because Buddha would say we come into this life fully programmed with these instinctive habits. So we don't notice most of the time what's going on inside us, which is what is informing what we do with our body and speech. But basically every millisecond we are sowing seeds in our mind that will ripen in the future as certain results Buddha says. So to learn this theory first is kind of crucial. It's completely abstract to us. We do not think of the world this way. It is absolutely not evident that my killing a mouse will sow many seeds in my mind that will ripen in the future as suffering rebirths. Just like there's nothing in our mind that can see that there must have been a virtuous, very powerful virtuous karmic seed that ripened was triggered before I stopped breathing that was a virtuous seed, a morality seed that, that programmed my consciousness from that second already, weeks in advance, programmed my consciousness to find its way on autopilot to my present mummy's human womb. This is clearly not evident to us. That's what we call religion. That's what we call belief. No, Buddha says it's true it says he's observed it so we don't believe him but we have confidence if we're prepared to and then we look into it just like we would what Einstein says you can't believe you can't see the truth of relativity first don't be ridiculous you can't see the truth of anything first you've got to first learn it take the theory and then learn it and then you tr see the truth of it eventually you're the boss same here just the same with karma just the same no difference exactly the same approach you heard of acupuncture for the first time in your life. You think these weird, wacko people putting needles in you. Never heard of such a ridiculous idea. But then you start to look into it. And then you start to get some confidence. And then you, buy, then you start to take it on board as your working hypothesis. And then what you're doing, practicing acupuncture, is you're, you're, you're experiencing it for yourself. And crucially, you are verifying the truth of it. And if acupuncture is a valid system, a system, it has to be this way. The same with what Buddha is saying. The same with what everybody says. It's up to us, we're the boss, to prove it to be true. And you've got to start with the theories. So understanding karma then, the law of karma for Buddha is fundamental to be able to interpret your own life and then to inform your decisions about what to do and what to say. So another way of putting this very simply is if every millisecond of what we think and do and say is sowing seeds in our mind, we know the analogy of a seed is a good one because it implies a fruit will come. So you know yourself, if you're a gardener, you'd better be very careful what seeds you plant. And the seed you plant has to be for the fruit you want. We, underst we understand that beautifully. That's the approach to living a life according to the Buddha's view of karma. It's, got, it's, that, it's that kind of logic. You've got to know the result of the thing you think and do and say, and because then you choose to think and do and say that one. 
It's a perfectly reasonable theory, just that we don't think that way, you know. So what also informs all this is that we have to understand the mind. Because in this number two point is, is, the, is the engagement of the mind in that action of killing the mouse. And if your mind is not engaged in it, if there is the first point, the mouse, but the, third point's, the second point is completely missing because you don't see the mouse, there can't be intention, the recognition, there can't be intention and there can't be motivation. So your mind does not play a role in it. Your foot stands on the mouse number three and the mouse dies number four. But you don't create karma. How can you? because karma is done by the mind. The, indeed, if the body and speech is also involved, like in my case, then it's a complete karma, body, speech, and mind. But if it's just body and speech, or just body, you can't say there's karma. Karma means the mind. This is a, a massive point for the Buddha. So we have to understand the mind. Utterly fundamental. Which means we have to understand Buddha's model of the mind. How does it function? As we were saying, Buddha says mind is not physical. Buddha says your mind is not the handiwork of your parents or of a creator, which are the only two options we have on this earth. You're either, you know, you're either the product of your mother and father, they're basically your creator, or God's your creator. They're the two options, you know. Well, Buddha's got a third option. He says, guess what? As His Holiness says, it's, a, it's self-creation. Buddha says you come into this life fully programmed, the first second of conception, with all the seeds in the mind from your past actions that will determine First, determine your, your rebirth as a human before you even stop breathing. Secondly, determine all your tendencies, whether you're more like Hitler or Mother Teresa, your tendency to be good at piano, good at music, to be clever, intelligent, psychotic, miserable, depressed, full of rage, full of anger, whatever you name it. All your tendencies, they are yours. Nothing to do with your mummy and daddy. Big shock. Mummy and daddy might share them and they got them because they were good at them too. You got them because you were good at them and then you come together and keep hanging out being fascists or whatever you were, you know, <laughs> together. But your mummy can't make you a fascist. Your mummy can't make you a pianist. Your mummy can't make you a footballer. Your mummy can't make you angry. <coughs> this is a shock to us. This is a default, absolute belief we have at the moment, that I'm an innocent victim who didn't ask to get born, and either God did it or mummy and daddy did it. And you don't want to blame God unless you're Italian. Uh, apparently a Brazilian told me that they're even worse than the Italians in blaming God, so who knows. But if you're a materialist, we love to blame mummy and daddy. Love to blame mummy and daddy. Put says, don't be ridiculous. You come fully programmed with your own tendencies, number one. Number two, you come programmed with all the seeds that will ripen in in the way you are seen and treated by others. It's the best way to say it. It's called experiences similar to the cause. When we can get even just these two, we can understand our life, using Buddha's model, of course. We can interpret our life correctly. So to get these down clearly, if you want to be a Buddhist, is extremely important, because every millisecond of your life, you can interpret why things happen. Right now, we don't know why things happen. You're, a, you're born as a good person but someone thinks you're lying and you know you're not. It's like a nightmare, we go mad. We don't know why. There's no explanation in science for why this is. The Buddha says it's very simple. One track of karma is your tendencies. And let's say you're born with nice ones. Don't lie, steal, don't kill, kind, moral, loving, respectful. Lots of people like this. But you've got another track of karma called experiences similar to the cause, which is all the stuff that happens to you and all the, in other words, all the sentient beings that you meet in your life, how they treat you, starting with your mummy and daddy. Starting with your mummy and daddy. So all the things that happen to us, Buddha says, there's, ka there's, there's, there's logic to this, you know, which is such a shock to us. Because we think life is random. We think just there's no cause, it's good luck, it's bad luck. That's what we believe is a scientific truth. All Buddha says is no, he's got another view of it. He's observed it to be that each sentient being, every rat, every dog, every cockroach, every human, and all the other sentient beings that he would posit as existing, each millisecond are experiencing the fruits of their past actions. This is the way to put it, you know. And that includes all the good and all the bad. This is Buddha's observation. So that's, you know, this is what a Buddhist would be taking as their working hypothesis of how to interpret their life. And therefore, how to interpret what happens now, but obviously being the good gardener, what will inform your choices because you know the fruits you want in the future. And you want happy fruits, very simple. And we're not talking compassion here. That's too advanced, that's, high, that's university, okay? We're talking junior school. Take care of yourself first. 
Know what causes you happiness and what causes you suffering and get yourself together. Then you can help other sentient beings. That's advanced. If you haven't got a clue why you're miserable, why you're depressed, why people are mean to you, you can't help but flee. So you've got to know your mind and what informs why what's in there. And then to help you understand your life as well, this is what you have the, the law of karma and the mind. These are the fundamentals of all the Buddha's universe, view of the universe actually. It's not, as I said, it's not the way most people think of Buddhism. Most people think of Buddhism as being mindful, watching your breath and walking slowly or something. Well, I'd I would not qualify. I do not watch my breath, I do not walk slowly, and, I, and I, uh, maybe I'm mindful, who knows, I don't know. <laughs> mindful just means not forgetting what you're doing. Doesn't mean anything more than that. As Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. So knowing the Buddhist model of the mind, and most Buddhists don't, not being rude about us Buddhists, you know, knowing how the mind works, the contents of your mind, and knowing, too, the cognitive process, which is totally fascinating, the epistemological model of the mind. It's completely fascinating. As I said yesterday, sci Western scientists would love, would be totally fascinated by the, the, the Buddhist explanation of the functioning of the mind, the way the mind functions. It's extraordinarily sophisticated. If they just want to posit the possibility that maybe they're not talking about the brain. They're talking about the cog Buddha's talking about the cognitive process itself. The way mental consciousness and sensory consciousness function. And as I said last night, all of this is coming from these amazing Indian, brilliant, genius, scientific thinker yogis more than 3,000 years ago, as Dalai Lama said, you know. This, this whole Buddhism came out of all this extraordinary tradition, these marvellous beings who created this technique called single, contra, single point of concentration, whose, whose basic understanding from their own internal process of how the mind functions is still the basis of all the texts in the Tibetan monastic university system studied today. All of this is the technology, if you like, Buddhist technology that informs the life the choices one makes as a Buddhist. So it's a, it's a very different model, of course it is, from the way we think in the West, it's completely different. And it naturally takes time to take it on board according to the level you want to take it on board because you are the boss, not Buddha. You don't have to think all this way. I just know for myself since a little girl, I always wanted the big picture, you know? When I went to church and I saw the priest, and I loved the idea of God. I think about God the whole time. The meaning of the universe and why this and why that. I love the idea that God was everywhere. You know, I'd say God is in the light switch and God is in the margin of my of my of my schoolwork. You know, I try to imagine God in the margin. I try to get what it means. God is everywhere. You know, I mean, I think I love to think about this, and I yearn to be a priest. They told me I, I can't be a priest. They said, <laughs> Could be, I had to be a nun. They said, so I said, all right. <laughs> so sure enough. Anyway, blah, blah. So everyone's different, you know? But I know I wanted the big picture. I always wanted the big picture. And as I said last night, it sounds so arrogant, but I wanted truth and freedom. I want freedom, I think, even more than anything. No, maybe truth. Not sure. I want to, you know, but this kind of, I want to understand how things work. I never went the scientific way. I went always the political way, you know? Or the, th the philosophical way, I suppose, yeah. So that's up to each one of us, you know? I can't, I'd like to talk about Buddhism like this, because for me, this is what the Buddhist teachings are. And it's up to each one of us to take on board 1% or more of this because we are the boss, not Buddha. Keep remembering that. It's a very big point. So, okay. Just briefly mention the principles of karma, which is the law of cause and effect that plays out in a person's mind. You can't separate these two. So you have to know the nuts and bolts of these laws and the nuts and bolts of the psychological model. These are the, uh, the, like they're the makings of Buddhist philosophy and psychology. That's what being a Buddhist is. Understanding and utilising and applying these principles. Everything's covered by that, you could say. So let's look into the mind, how it works. Well, for one way, you know, if you study the epistemological model, you learn that we've got mental consciousness and we have sensory consciousness. And already, this is really delicious. 
it's already can, we can already see how this how we make we have utterly confused because we don't understand the functioning of these two parts of us already this is fascinating you know so you know i will go i might go i might go let me have a look no i wouldn't yes i would maybe oh what a pretty cup i might go <laughs> yes it's quite quite interesting quite nice so i will go there's a pretty cup so we all deduce do we not without thinking that that means my eyes are seeing a pretty cup that's how we would think or you know if i say george is so divine <laughs> we all think my eyes are seeing a handsome person and we understand this as very powerful and very vivid isn't it not buddha says don't be ridiculous you know, when you study the Buddhist model, you learn about how the sense consciousnesses function. And so we've got the five senses, let's say. So when Buddha says that, he means the five sense consciousnesses. The word consciousness in general is used synonymously with the word mind, for a start. And then, the, and then so we know that we've only got the, set, the eyeball, right? We, you know, we've got the eyeball. As far as we're concerned in the West, there's no such thing as consciousness that is not physical. So Buddha deduces that consciousness and mind are not physical. So your eye consciousness, that part of you that isn't physical, that part of your mind that we would say in the Buddhist view that functions through the medium of the physical, and they even talk about a subtler physical level, but never mind that here. But we would say functions through the medium of the eyeball, You've got eye consciousness and you have eyeball, okay? Two. You can have an eyeball, we all know that, but your eyelid can be open, but you don't see anything. Well, the Buddhist view is because the eye consciousness is not functioning for all sorts of reasons, probably because the physical is not working as well. But never mind, the Buddhist view is this eye consciousness, which is equivalent to mind, which is not physical, that is the part of your mind that functions through the eyeball, the ear consciousness, the tactile, the five, as we know. Well, the Buddhist view is very clear. The, these five sense consciousnesses the job of consciousness in general, whether mental or sensory, is to cognize something. And they each specifically have their own object of cognition. So the eye consciousness has precisely two things it can cognize. Shape and color. That's it. That's it. Totally limited. Like dumb animal, you know? Very limited. So then you've got to ask yourself, well, where does what a pretty cup come from? It clearly, pretty cup is not an object of eye consciousness. Shape and colour, and then you've got to start, so what happens is this, and it's brilliant, the way they describe in the teachings, and I love this analogy, clearly Buddha didn't use this one. Within, a, within the, the instantaneous millisecond that my eye consciousness gloms onto this shape and colour, what happens is instantaneously my mental consciousness is, is, uh, is triggered quicker, and I mean this sincerely, quicker than Google. <laughs> and what it will do is access everything in my, this is how they talk about how, con con how conceptuality functions. Because mental consciousness, as Lama Zopa says, that's where the workshop is. That's where all our information is. That's where our memory is. That's where everything Buddha says since beginningless time, that's how old our mind is. Every millisecond of what any sentient being has ever seen, heard, tasted, touched, smelt, or thought about, not one millisecond of it has gone astray. It has gone imprinted in the mind. Like you've taken photos of everything since beginningless time and they're all programmed in your consciousness. So what happens is, the millisecond my eye consciousness grabs onto this shape and colour, my mental consciousness is triggered. That's where the workshop is, that's where my information is. So up comes. So first of all, even this is so fascinating, the process of, of conceptuality, which is the grosser level of our mental consciousness, which is how we function day to day, how that even works is beyond insane. What it does is, what is triggered is every single tiny phenomenon that is not a cup is called up into my mental consciousness. And that each one of those is, um, what's the term you uh, process of? Eliminated. And then what, and that's called a non cup. Every single milli object I've ever known in my life that's stored in my memory will come up as non cup. And they're all, they're all eliminated. And then what comes up finally is what's one thing that's left is called non non cup. And get what, guess what non non cup is? Cup. It's all this is happening in a millisecond, quicker than Google. Computers are like grinding elephants in comparison. 
with the mental consciousness. This is the findings of these great yogis and then Buddha since then and all the great meditators since. It's the workings of our mental consciousness. It's insane, sophisticated, incredible, fascinating. And why it happens so quickly, why when I look at this cup I've got to go, oh, what's that? And then Google it, you know, handle, and what's that? That's orange, that's flower, that's gold. It'll take you 10 years to find it out if you didn't have the memory, isn't it? But it's all stored away in there. And because I've brought up in my life my opinions about what's pretty, what's not, out comes, oh, there's a pretty cup, you know? So senses are nothing. And that's a shock to us. As Lama Zep, Lama Yeshi says, we make the body the boss. And because in our materialist world, we only posit physical. For us, senses are everything. And, and you know, it's highly complex how all these things occur, according to the Buddhist view. You've got your mental consciousness. And then when your mental consciousness, we've got this, the, the positive states of mind, the negative states of mind, and all the millions of others are like the mechanics of our mind that are called the neutral states, all doing their job, like milli, millions of a second quick, all working together to, to bring us our experiences in day to day. And the Buddha says we've been programmed with this stuff for countless lives, which is how come we come into this life instinctively, this way or that. Programming, done by our mind from countless past. Not programming from mummy and daddy and grandma and grandpa going back to the apes, you know, not those ones, not like that. <laughs> That's how we program in the West. Buddha says you just program in your own mind. It's a very different model, very interesting. So we have to know our own mind. We have to unpack and unravel and deconstruct and label precisely each millisecond of everything there. It's a full-time job. It's phenomenal, the internal job that we need to do, Buddha says, to do the job that he says we can accomplish, which is ridding it of all the rubbish, which happens to be adventitious and developing all the goodness, which is at the core of our being. Maybe it's time for questions. I don't know. Maybe it's time for tea. What time is it? 11 o'clock. What time's tea? Is there a tea break? Where's the bosses? Is there a tea break? Please answer me. There is a tea break. No, there is a tea. You mean there's tea and cakes out there for people? Oh, well, good. What time? Wait a minute. What time's lunch? Lunch is 12.30, I believe. We'll have a bit longer, then we'll have a tea break. So any questions first before we go on? We can then start to unpack the things I'm talking about for the rest of the day. Any questions? Hello. Though? Hi. Before we have a tea break. Yes. Hi. Yes. How are you? Yes. Good. Uh, you say Buddha, when you're talking about Buddha, you're saying that the teachings and Buddha talks about, you know, many times you'll say the universe. The, the who? The universe. I Limit, say... Limitless. Uh, uh, lim uh, go on. In, in other words... Um, when speaking about, uh, for example, reincarnation, karma, yes. uh, so forth and so on, yeah. it seems to me that it's so, um, no pun intended, egocentric, and what I, almost like the Christian definition of, uh -huh. of uh, what is. Okay. For yes. example, okay. when you talk about reincarnation, yeah. <clears throat> it's always in terms of if the best chance to be re, uh, enlightened, mm. one of the better chances mm. to be enlightened, mm. besides karma, planting seeds, mm is to um, come back in the human body, okay. or the human form, right? That's what Buddha would have found to be so. Yeah, that's his yes. observation, that's his but experience. But scientists are now discovering yep. and have hypothesized yep. that we're nothing more than a grain of sand uh -huh. in a limitless pool of galaxies. That's right, exactly, you're right. And that, but um, you're right, I agree with you. So what's your question? Yes. Cut the to question the is, why is it always limited to uh -huh. human bodies uh -huh. So, okay, or, okay, good or, question, or, good or, question. Or, What's your name? Or Dan. Thank you, Dan. Go on. Human bodies. Yep, then, or? When there are multi-dimensions in the universe. Yes, yes, Dan. And who is to say that the human body, who is to say that's the best way to be enlightened? Right, Dan, I, mean, I understand. There could be a praying mantis. Dan, I got your question. <laughs> I'm not being mean. I am being mean, but I'm not being mean. Yep. Dan, 
Yes, if you want to talk about it from the external point of view, you're exactly right. The universe is where like a grain of sand. There's a trillion, trillion, vast, limitless, you're absolutely right. But if you, Dan, have to start investigating that world, don't you think you have to start with the part of you that does the cognizing, which is called the mind? And you can only know Dan's mind, not mine. So you've got to start with the small piece, which is you. And then the Buddha would say, when you've finally done the job of ridding your self-centeredness from your mind, which is why you suffer and why you, you have tunnel vision, join the universe here, and why you harm others, and miserable and suffering is because of these delusions so you working on your mind then causes you eventually to become a Buddha whose mind will see the limitless reality and whose consciousness will pervade the universe who will be able to benefit every sentient being every second for as long as time exists so you're heading towards that one but you've got to start where you are Dan which is called self-centered neurotic separate miserable poor self-pity me you've got to start with you where else can you start where would you start well, there's, yes, yes, I have to start with myself. I'm there's nowhere else you can start, but with you. Yes, but also they are, they are uh, scientists are now coming to the conclusion uh -huh. with quantum physics yes. that time doesn't just go forward. There may be the possibility okay, good, Dan, that listen, time can going, go back. Dan, I'm happy with every word you're saying, but guess who's going to prove it? You, baby. So don't tell me all your theories. I'm happy to hear your theories. I'm, I mean, we're, we're talking Buddha's view here. I'm not asking you to believe a damn word he's saying. I'm not asking you to believe these scientists either. You are the one who's got to go and experience it and verify it to be true. Everyone's allowed to give their view. Everybody. Fred, the, 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 you know, the, the communists, the Jews, the Catholics, the Hitlers, they're all allowed to give their views. But you are the only one who can look into it and decide what's true and what's not. So great. All the scientists. I love it. Fantastic. Go for it. It just means more work for you to do to find out what's true and what isn't. Is it not, Dan? I love what you're saying, but you're the boss here. I'm just giving you Buddha's view because it's my job here. I'm not a scientist, I'm a Buddhist. So I'm giving you Buddha's take on the universe and I'm saying it's coming from Buddha's view, like a scientist. And it's up to you, if you want to, to look into it and to see if it's true or not. That's the, the approach here. So I, I love what you're saying, perfect. But you have to find out. Otherwise, who will? You have to be certain, don't you? Do you see what I'm saying? So you start with who we are, and the Buddha's saying your consciousness has the capacity to expand, to pervade the entire universe and know that which exists. That's what he says. And we're aiming, we're heading towards that. So I'm just giving you Buddha's take on it all. And you, could, you have to find out. Who's to say, as you said, that a human's the only one? Who's to say is you to find out if it's true? Buddha's allowed to say humans are the ones who've got the best bet. That's for you to decide by looking at it whether he's right or wrong. And that's the same with, is that not the scientific approach? Einstein can say what he likes, but you have to see if it's true or not. You see my point? That's the point I'm making here. I'm just giving you Buddha's take on things. I think we're communicating, Dan, are we? Y yes, I have to... Uh, but what's your butt? Come on, what's your butt? It's, I, I gotta think about it. Your butt is more... <laughs> no, no, what? You're gonna give up. I got, no, I'm not gonna give up, I gotta think about it. Yeah, of course you do, yes. <laughs> Honey, so what we're talking here, you just presented some ideas from some scientists. I've just presented some ideas from the Buddha. And all we're doing is that we've got these equal status, they're different views. Would you agree? Different views, aren't they? So all Why I'm saying... Can't they coexist? Honey, that's for you to find out. You, all I'm doing is presenting to you. All I'm doing is presenting you what Buddha says. It's for you to check up. It's for you to find out by looking into science, looking into this, looking into that. Yes, I could say the last 30 years, the Dalai Lama and all the Tibetans have been having these amazing conferences with the best brains in the West. He's got this mindandlife.org. I don't know if you've looked into it all. The amazing conferences, they've all been published the last 30 years. Exactly the point that you're making, bringing the Buddhist views and the scientific ones together, which is fantastic. There's masses of stuff out there the last 30 years published. Mindandlife.org. You'll really like it. So yes, you have to find that out, honey. You're the boss here. Nobody else in the universe can do it but you. I'm sure we're communicating. No, I know no, we I, are. It, I hear you. Good. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Who else? Yes. And it's uh, what time? Okay, nearly tea time. Yeah, couple more questions. I mean, I swear I sound like a Hitler when I talk, Dan. <laughs> Dan, get off him. Leave him alone. <laughs> no, leave him alone. Let him think what he wants. I will not. Leave the man alone. 
Let him do what he wants and think what he wants. I'm trying to make him feel better. You're very good at that. And I love you for it. Dan, I sound like Hitler when I talk. I do accept that. Oh, all right. <laughs> go on. I'm having a hard time. Where are you, darling? I'm, I'm here. To... Yes, go. Um, understanding um, uh, karma arising as a situation that's similar to the cause. That's and what they say, I was yeah. hoping maybe you could give an example of. Oh, well, what yes, that exactly. Be. So the track of karma in your life that's called experiences similar to the cause is, let's say, people, you're telling the truth, but people don't believe your words. Or you don't steal, but people steal from you. So you've got, a, you've got the one track of karma, it, you know, it doesn't have to be, it could be the same. You could steal and be stolen from. But you know, if it's, if whatever you experience out there at the hands of others, good or bad, regardless of what you do now, that's the fruit of action similar to that in the past. That's what it means. It's a track from seeds in that little garden plot that ripen as people not believing your words because of your past lying. People believing your words because of your past truth telling, even if you're not telling the truth. That's what it means. You're getting killed. You're dying young, for example, is called the experience similar to the cause of your having killed in the past. You see what I'm saying? Yes. That's what it means. And could I clarify, because you also emphasize that karma is an experience of what arises in my mind? I, I said no, karma plays out in your mind, meaning karma uh. is not this kind of, I was trying to get past a bit the kind of cliched ideas we have about karma, like a big stick we use to hit ourselves with. It's more a name for referring to the law of cause and effect, which plays out in our minds and lives. So am I uh, mistaken about people believing that I'm lying? Meaning, is it arising in another mind that disbelieves me, or is it my perception that they disbelieve me? No, I mean, it's very simple. If you say something to me that's true and I refuse to believe you, that's happening in my mind, honey. But you can be paranoid and think I don't believe you when in fact I do. That's, you've got to work that one out. So you've got to see what is the truth. And it's very simple. You say to me, do you believe me? And I'll say, no, I don't. That's, that's me simply not believing you. And that is an external reality to you. But it's due to your past action that you have this experience of not being believed. Do you understand? That's how yes. it's okay, thank you. I think we have tea time. Oh, what? okay, one more. Just one more. Go, darling, yes. There's the mic. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. No, uh, uh, if we begin today, let's say, we, we're going to investigate the mind, we're going to understand why yes. we... Uh, that doesn't eradicate the seeds of past karma. No, it doesn't. It's just one part of our job, to learn to know the mind, the model of it, how it works, what is negative, what is positive. Then we have to look at the way karma works and look at the theories of karma and to know how to stop sowing more negative seeds and to how to pull out the seeds we've already planted before they ripen. Right. That's a whole separate approach. So they all work together, but we've got to take them in isolation and look at the laws of karma and how they work and how to apply in daily life. And then we have to look at the mind and, its, and how it functions, and we bring these two together. And the, the workings of these two is what being a Buddhist is. Great, thank you. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Yes. Thank you. One more. The gentleman behind. Yes. Hi. Um, what, what was the Buddha's perspective on animals? I'm still not really clear I understand. That. They're yeah. one of the many, many kinds of mind possessors. So we can see, isn't it, that we share the planet with these beings and we're even called animals in our scientific model. And you, would, you could say, and we'll talk about this, we could say that we share the same characteristics when it comes to attachment and fears and anger and neurosis and harming and killing and stealing with animals. Have a look, we're all very similar. And the, the, the one, this is where my point to Dan, the, and we have to look at this, you know, it's not a hierarchical kind of position. But if we look at a human, if we're fortunate, we've got, the, we've got added access to some of our virtues. We can put two and two together. We can learn to, you know, we can learn to be kind and to let go of old habits, you know, and to be, and, and we can, act, if we can access our, excise, access our virtues, that's the characteristic of being a human that makes the human life worthwhile. I mean, we've got the same attitude, the same, same you know, delusions as animals. We're exactly the same. Buddha's model of the mind, by the way, refers to all living beings, not just humans. So is an, is an earthworm, for example, on like a lower rung? Lower simply, no, it's an animal. It's simply meaning a certain type of animal, isn't it? And <laughs> I, we would suggest that Buddha would say it's a mind possessor, but it's got a very limited access to only some parts of its mind and mostly just instinctive. Doesn't have much, doesn't have much ability to grow its mind, can't become wise, can't develop compassion, you know, mm. very limited. But is it in that state of being an earthworm because of its... Karma. There's no sentient being that is experiencing anything other than what it created itself, because mm -hmm. Buddha basically says we all created ourselves. 
And I would, I would also say that, I mean, it seems non-intuitive to me that like a, a dog, for example, has the same neuroses that a human can That's have. That's right, it has, yes. But how? Because it seems like they don't, they don't get, um, well, I suppose they get frustrated, but I, I wouldn't say that a, jo a dog Excuse gets... Excuse me? Dogs don't get angry? They don't rip yeah. each other's flesh out I when guess they're they upset? Do. Yeah. That's called anger, dear. Yeah. They don't bark with paranoia every time they hear the, do the door squeak. Mm. That means they can't put two and two together. They're a bit stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Buddha would say they've been humans countless okay. times, and we've been dogs and earthworms countless times, because the one continuity is consciousness. And all rebirth is, and we'll go into this in more detail, I'm trying to explain it, are just these manifestation of different states of mind that come along with a certain level of physicality. All the sentient beings are like this. Mm. We'll describe it a bit more. Okay, thank you. Let's have tea and cake or whatever. This is actually a follow-up. I'm, I'm here. Okay, yes, go. This is a follow-up on your talk oh, on, on Wednesday, from your yes, talk okay, good. Wednesday. Yes, okay, Is there, it is something as collective karma. Collective? Yeah, collective karma. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can see, can't, can't we see that we're intensely social, keep the mic. Do we see animals, for example, and humans, we're very social, would you agree with that? Totally yeah. social creatures. Yes. We do everything in groups. And we identify with groups really fiercely, don't we? And we fight groups and we have friends of groups. So clearly that's called collective karma. You know, as a group of people who suffer a terrible thing, a group of people who have a beautiful life. We can see some countries are very peaceful, the environment's lovely, no one's disturbing them. That's collective karma. Yes, definitely. Because we do things individually, but we do things in groups, don't we? And we can see we get the result as well. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Someone else. Hi, I have a question about um, how can we be the boss when it comes to unintended action? Our own. Yeah. Yeah, I know. No. Okay, yeah. So the fact is, right now, it's as if we're not the boss at all. We are completely, because we believe we're not the boss, because we believe totally that everything out there is the cause of why I'm good or bad. We're like total victims. We walk around like complete victims. So we're not realizing that we're, in, that we're not, we are the boss insofar as everything we experience is the fruit of what we have done. In that sense, we created it, but we just don't realize. And secondly, like you're saying, 99% of what we do and think and say is programmed, is instinctive, because we never pay any attention to it. But we don't realize that that is the cause of whatever we experience. So in the sense, we are not a, we are the boss insofar as everything we experience is a fruit of what I've done, but we don't think we're the boss and it's as if we're not the boss because we feel like victims. But when we realize that we are in charge, that we, ha that we have to learn to become in charge and that's eventually what we can do totally. You don't look like I'm making any sense at all. I, I ask this question is because I'm thinking about the whole like fly around the stupa example. Yes. Uh, because it was not the intention of the... Oh, okay, that's... No, okay, okay, now I see what you're saying. <laughs> but, but... Okay, I understand your question, totally. Okay, in general, the teaching about karma, the view of the way the mind works, intention, as we discussed before, when it comes to the mouse, intention and then the motivation that, that impels the intention, because if we look at everything we think to do, I will walk out the door, I will kill the mouse, I will give you five dollars. We can always see beneath that intention, it's, 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 um, it's compelled by or impelled by a motivation, isn't it? And that's how most of what we do when it's strongly intentional. But, and this is what the Buddha would say, there needs to be the motivation there and that's what is the main cause of the intentional action you do as to whether it ripens as happiness or suffering. But there are some actions we do that, don't, that are said to be in relation to very potent objects. And this is what we have to think about it because it sounds like religion. So because of the power, they say, of Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, of what, of what potent objects like a stupa, according to the Buddhists, what they represent, any actions we do in relation to very potent objects, negative or positive, will bring results whether we had the intention or not. So they would say a mother, your mother, for example, is a very potent object for you, strong karmic connection. And even if you don't intend to, doing very harmful things to your mother or very kind things without intention would still bring karma. So certain actions, when the object is very potent, without intention there is karma created. That's what they say. So in those instances, how can we take control or become the boss of, of those unintended Well, actions? if you don't know, you don't, you can't. 
But if you do know that an action done in relation to a stupa will, be good, will sow lots of good virtuous seeds for you, then you can choose to do it. But you can't. I mean, you can't because you don't know. I mean, but 99% of what we do and say and think we don't know what we're doing because we're completely ignorant. We don't have clairvoyance. We don't have much intelligence about it. There's no control anyway, whether it's intended or not. Okay, so is it just a matter of also like developing wisdom? To well, precisely. That's the point. Yes, of course. And because the Buddha would say that karma is a natural law, like mathematics, like gravity, like botany, it can be known. That's the whole point. That's what the job of being a Buddhist. It's not a question of just faith in it. It's learning to actually know the workings of karma, which is a completely, it was extremely sophisticated and demands immense wisdom. But the point is the Buddha would say it is knowable and the proof of it is that he was a regular guy who got to cognize it and present it. So therefore we can do it too. That's the whole point, to be in charge. So the more we know, the same with gardening. I'm like, oh, like gardening is a good example. The more we understand botany, the more we can be in control of the process. It's sort of obvious, you know, and we, we live our lives this way. The more we understand mathematics and engineering and architecture and recipes and cooking, the more we can make cakes and, grow and build buildings. It's logical. That's called wisdom. So then the ultimate of wisdom would be that there's no such thing as something unintended. Is that right? I see you. I see you. That's interesting, yeah. You could say that when you really develop wisdom, you're totally in charge of every millisecond of your universe. Of course you are. Yes, of course, of course. Completely in charge. That's a consequence of becoming omniscient, becoming a Buddha. Absolutely. Thank you. Even, even you could say, even just getting single-pointed concentration, this marvelous technique the Hindus created, even just that, is such phenomenal control. When you've got that single-pointed concentration, which is, an in, which is a, a, a state of mind that is not posited even remotely as existing in our materialist views of the mind, where you have utter and effortless control over every thought. I mean, that sounds like insanity. And you haven't even realized emptiness yet. You can have that. We can have phenomenal control over our minds. Still nowhere near the, the end result. But we, and that's, in general, the process we're trying to get into, to have control over the mind, know, what the, know everything, know, to, be in char to genuinely be in charge of the process eventually. That's the point. It's a doable thing, in other words, the Buddha's saying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. So two things. Getting back to the mouse. Yep. Um, how could, and that's only one part of my question, how could the fact of you not wanting, you meaning the general you, um, not wanting that mouse in your kitchen. How could that be a higher virtue than somebody looking at the mouse and seeing first off that they don't, don't want to injure that mouse? Apart from you doing it for the right reason, what wrong reason. What was the reason, first thing you said? How can it be a what? How can that be more virtuous in any Who way? You said killing a mouse is virtuous. Okay. You didn't say, I mean, you're saying that it's... I'm saying it's not virtuous. It's the point. Oh my God, who said it's virtuous? I thought you said that as long as you're conscious and you're, you have conscious about what you're doing, that it's okay. Oh my God, no, 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 oh, no, okay. no, okay. no, no, I, no, 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 Good, 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 good. Because I'm here, Diana, goddess of, of, the, of the animals here. I didn't kind of finish it properly. Let me tell you the okay. whole story. Oh my gosh, thank you very much. It's very helpful to answer that. I have another question. part of the question too, but you want, me to, you want to do that one first? Go, go, go. No, no. Okay. The other thing is, is that when you get, you say are naturally detached from certain things like being liked or caring about what other people think and whatever. Sure, sure, sure. Yep. That would be, you would, you, one would think, one, the general one again, yes. would think that that gives you more freedom and makes you feel better because you're not Absolutely. really. Yeah. But then the actions you've taken because you don't care so much about what people are going to think or be, accept you or whatever, I walk that road sometimes, then you have to contend with the people who wish they could do that, but don't. So then, then you're getting the anger, frustration. Are you following me? The, Your anger or theirs? The, no, from other people who really look oh, at that. But that's, okay, okay, I hear you. Because, I'll, I'll, give you I'll give you, well, I was going to give you an example, but we have the mouse and we have that. Do you understand do the, the second first. part? No, let me do the mouse first. Okay, good. Okay. In general, <laughs> how you know, an action of karma is created in, and the, okay, every, first of all, every millisecond of whatever we think and do and say, you can say, we're sowing seeds of one kind or another. And much of the time it's unconscious because we're just on autopilot. So we start to unpack 
an action and begin to understand the components that make an action an action, which means we have to break it down into these component parts. So the example we're using is what they call a complete action of killing. That could be just as easy. Okay, let's use the example of a complete action of non-killing. You know, so you, you can, so then you've got to first have the object in the, in the mouse in the kitchen. And in, let's, say any, let's say a mouse that's just getting in your way. First is the object. Second is recognition. The number two is intention with three parts. 2A is that mouse. 2B is intention. I will not kill that mouse. I will, I will, I will avoid harming that mouse. It's a very strong intention. And three, wait, let me finish. The motivation is genuine compassion. You with me? So that's. But there's a four to it. The four is you have to know that there's an alternative to it, like have a heart trap. Some people no, don't see no, that. No, we're not no? discussing that. Okay. We're just looking at one single action, not at other alternatives. All right, that's another action. We're looking at this particular scenario, in which case you have a mouse in your kitchen, and, right. and the action is going to be an action called non killing, mm -hmm. which is a very virtuous action. Okay. For it to be a complete action, and there's a specific thing about a complete action. We haven't gone into all this yet, but a, a complete action is one that leaves a seed in your mind that will then g multiply and then ripen as many fruits in the future of particular type of rebirth. A complete action is what brings a rebirth. Other actions are not complete and they bring tendencies, they bring experiences. There's a whole, it's quite complex, but this is a complete action, an example of a complete action. Are you with me so far? Okay, so in other words, for you to be a human, it's a very strong, complete action of s intentional morality that is the cause of you getting a human body. Okay, so a strong, intentional, virtuous action that's got these four components in it is one that leaves seeds in your mind that will ripen as a type of rebirth, a good rebirth in the future. A strong, intentional, negative action is one that will ripen as a suffering rebirth, such as an animal and others, the Buddha would say. So we're discussing here a virtuous action of intentional non-killing. So in order to be a complete action, there first has to be the object, a living mouse. Two is named intention and the three parts. Two A is the state of mind in your mind discriminating, that's the mouse. Two B is intention, I will save that mouse, or I will avoid killing it, do you understand? Two C is your motivation, compassion. But no, I'm finished. Three, you do the action of avoiding killing the mouse. You put your foot in the other place instead of on the mouse. You consciously put your foot down and you avoid killing the mouse. And number four, the mouse is saved. And it says, thank you very much, bye, and it disappears. That's a complete action of non-killing. One, the object. Two, the recognition it's there and the intention and the compassion. Three, you do the action of consciously saving it. And number four, it gets away. That's a complete action of non-killing. Can you hear that? I can hear that, but I see something, another element. But I'm it. not discussing it. What, what element? Well, the fact that most people who would I'm not be... No, you're not... You're automatic, missing. I'm talking about automatic pilot. No, people no, would you're missing think the they can no, do that. Excuse me. You're missing the point. We're discussing, theoretically, what a complete action of virtue would be if it were that. If it was a mouse. I'm not discussing all the 47 other variations that equally a negative action of killing a mouse would be exactly the same except the intention would be to kill it and the motivation would be aversion. How disgusting, how dare a mouse be in my kitchen. The third one is you do the action and fourth is you rejoice and it's dead. That's a complete action of killing. But you could say, the, the point I'm getting at also is this. The key factor in general that determines what, that whatever action you do every moment of the day, whether it's positive or negative, meaning that it leaves a positive or a negative seed in your mind, meaning that that's a seed that will ripen either as your happiness or your suffering, because Buddha says every millisecond of everything we think and do and say does sow a seed that will bring future results. This is a fundamental law, he says. So then the, the main factor that determines what seed you plant in your mind, whether it's positive or negative, is the motivation, is the reason you do it. So your co genuine compassion to save that mouse is what makes it a powerful, virtuous action for you. You, you know, let's say I've got a mouse in my kitchen and it's the same thing. There's a living mouse. Two, intention. Two, A, recognition. There's the mouse. Two, B, intention. I will save that mouse. Two, two, to see motivation, attachment, because I want to eat it later. 
So my motivation looks nice. Oh, save the little mouse, be careful. And I put it in this little thing. And then three, I save the mouse. And four, the mouse is saved. But the reason is so I can eat it, kill it later and eat it. That's a heavy duty negative action. Do you see my point? Everything, and Buddha says everything we do is underpinned by our motivation, but we're as blind as bats because we're on autopilot most of the time. So therefore we, we are constantly sowing seeds every second. And to unpack it and to observe what's going on and to change it is what, is what we have to learn to do. To make our motivations positive, to refrain from doing harmful things, so we can be in charge of the process of sowing seeds that we know we want to sow that will bring the fruits we want. In general, this is the principle. And second part of second the question. Second part. Meaning, when you do do that, then you're No, I forget your other, what was the question well, you asked? it was asked? a basic thing, that if I'm going there, we can use the mouse into the second one. I forget your one. question of the other question, please. Yes, I'm going into that, and that is, when you become detached from the, the, the oh, automatic okay. pilot. Okay, so listen, okay. So there you are, attempting to live your life authentically, right. to make your choices based on what you think is most beneficial right. without too much neurotic worry about what people think. Exactly. And then you have people who don't like you. Well, honey, join the club. And our real practice is learning to not, is to learn to know, as our mothers would say, that sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. But ha ha, because we are junkies to what people think. So if a person's anger does upset us, it means we still do have attachment to reputation, which is the deepest attachment of all. So, you know, it's just part of our practice not to mind what people think, to be authentic, not to be stubborn, not to be arrogant, not to be passive aggressive, not to misuse it. But our deepest delusion is the craving to be seen as a nice person. It's primordial. And we're only when we're very advanced practitioners do we go beyond that, to have genuine authenticity, to have the courage to really follow our hearts and be undisturbed by what people think. It takes time. Are we communicating? We what? Are we communicating? We're communicating. Good. Any more questions? Yeah. Just a question about um, unpacking the, yeah. the second part mm. um, of intention. And where you, where you said the second B is... Intention. The, is the intention. And but C, C is, is the motivation. The motivation. Yes, I would different. have thought it would have been the reverse, where B would have been the motivation and, uh, and C would have been well, you the could, intention. Well, you could, either way, you could say that. I'd say, okay. but I think they come together pretty much if we're okay. trained in it. Thanks. Intention, I mean, the, the thing is here, often we use the word intention to mean motivation. And it's even used that in the Buddhist teachings quite a bit. But yeah. intention really is the bare bones meaning of the word karma. It's the mind involved. In the, it's like volition, will. The bare bones first action yeah. is I will walk, before my legs pick me up, you can guarantee I have the thought, I will walk out the door. Do you understand? Yeah. I will walk out the door. That's the meaning of intention. I will. I will. I will eat. I will sleep. I will kill. I will lie. I will this. I will that. And that's the one that drives us every millisecond. And much of it's on autopilot because it's instinctive. You know the little elephant that pops out of mummy's womb and turns around and starts sucking the milk? That's instinctive because of habit of attachment to milk, of being an animal and a human for so long, it knows what to do because it's imprinted in its mind. Much of what we do is instinctive. Where we sleep and eat and go to the toilet and want sex and all this, just this stuff arises spontaneously. There's no control over it because it's, it's programmed in us from countless lives, Buddha says. And, then that's, and that's what we have to start having control over the process. And then the control comes with working with the motivation. Control is comes that? from controlling first your body and speech and not following the deluded impulses, not following the wish to put 17 pieces of cake in your mouth, not following the impulse to jump on every person you see, not following the impulse to kill the roaches and the rats because we don't like them, not following the impulse to say mean words to people. That's regular, ordinary, first level practice. Control your behavior. Why? Because they're driven by delusions. That's why we do them. So we first control your behavior, now you can start to get some insight into the actual thoughts, which is more like high school. That's where the real work of being your own therapist is. Okay. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just behind, the gentleman behind. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, how does the karma of our ancestors play into what you've been discussing Ancestors' today? karma. Nothing to do with us at all. Uh, could you develop Because you could have been the rat in a past life and you jump into this new family, but there's nothing to do with you, your past, your grandma and grandpa. You've got some karmic connection with them, but you know, that it's not from, you're not, your, your karma's got nothing to do with them. So I guess in this case, could you... Um, Speak more about the karmic connection? Huh? Could you speak more about the karmic connection? Okay, I'll t yes, I'll talk about it. Yes, let's talk about that. So let's talk more about karma 
and more about the mind because they can just go together, you know. What? Oh, I see, I see, okay. When the, con when the conceptual mind works, after the sensory consciousness cognizes shape and colour, instantaneously the mental consciousness is triggered where all my memories are, all the imprints, all the seeds, all the things. So what they, out of interest, I'm just letting you know, the way they describe the conceptual mind, how it works, is it first instantaneously, every, the second my eye consciousness sees this, my mental consciousness is triggered and every single phenomenon that is stored away, by my, my, every phenomenon that I've known, which is the memory of which is stored away, that isn't a cup, which is known as a non-cup, is, is, comes up and then, then immediately, immediately um, what's the word I said before? Um, process of eliminated and then what arrived, finally what's left is the object called non-non-cup and of course that equals cup. Because they say the conceptual mind only cognizes in a very abstract way. We don't realize this, but we, it, doesn't, it doesn't cognize cup at all. That's a positive phenomenon. It only cognizes the, you know, in this way of a very, of kind of very negative kind of, in a, a non of, in, a, in a negating way. It's very abstract how it actually functions. Are you with me? So, huh? Okay, no. So, okay. Okay. <coughs> So the big picture, point of view, the Buddha says there are trillions and trillions of sentient beings. And he divides them into different categories. You know, realms is the term they use. You know, but there's equal, they've all got equal status as being mind possessors. So we've got, you know, in this desire realm that is one category of states of sentient beings as far as the Buddha's observation is concerned. And we can see that other beings and other religious views have similar observations. They just have very different interpretations, I would put it this way, you know. So you've got, in this desire realm, you've got kind of like about six different types of sentient beings. Only some of them do we even cognize with our ordinary deluded mind, you know. You've got the top end, like the top, the best suburbs, if you like, they call those like God realms. And that's equivalent to the, the, the Jews and the Muslims. I love the Jews. Jews never tell me what they believe in heaven or not. I never go, are there any Jews here? I ask everybody I know in Israel, everywhere, about what Jews say about heaven and nobody gives me a straight answer. <laughs> Anybody got any idea about what Jews posit once you die? Do you go to heaven or hell? They don't say anything. They don't say anything. They just say the, the world of the future and no one has, no one has any clue where they I'm going to tell you. Who knows? God. But God doesn't tell us. They don't study it. So you just have to cross your fingers. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, Buddha says there are these realms, God realms. Okay, I, can't, I want to tell you this. I find this extremely helpful for my own mind, okay? And this comes from the Vajrayana. I find it helpful, though. This model of the universe, Buddha's model, they talk about how, we've got the, you know, there's physical matter and there are minds. That's it. Physical matter and the physical matter, just like our culture, now, Galileo and that mob way back in the Middle Ages talked about, it's made of the four elements. So this is the Buddha's view still, that it's made, physical matter is made of the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. So the, the universe consists of matter and then minds. And what's totally fascinating, and I find this very helpful to understand karma, just little bits and pieces I find helpful. In the Vajrayana teachings, they talk about how every consciousness, every mind, every mind stream, and remember the Buddha would say there are trillions in all these different realms of existence which I'm going to talk about. All these mind streams, continu continuities of consciousness, mental mind streams, rivers of mental moments, whatever term you want to kind of use, you know, these consciousnesses. They're inextric each one of them is, has got its own, is linked inextricably to its own set of the four elements. This is something huge when you study the Vajrayana, which is the same model as the Tibetan medical system uses, you know. So when your Tibetan doctor feels your pulses, similar to the Chinese one, they're going to feel your subtle, subtle physical energy, which is this subtle prana or wind energy we know from all the yoga business, the Hindus, they come up with this too. They're going to feel your subtle physical energy, which is inextricably linked with your mind. 
They talk about even in the Vajrayana how your mind rides on the winds. So they talk about the subtle physical energy, what there's 72,000 subtle channels through which coursing, uh, is coursing all this wind energy and the different states of mind. I mean, this is not how we talk in our culture when we talk about the brain, a completely different model. So the gross level, we have gross consciousness, subtle consciousness, very subtle consciousness. We have gross body, this bag of bones here. And the, and the level of consciousness that's inextricably linked with this gross body, our sensory consciousness. Then we have subtle consciousness, which includes much of our thinking, which is inextricably linked to this subtle wind energy and that's, that this wind going through the subtle nervous system. So when your Tibetan doctor feels your pulses, she's feeling an imbalance of your subtle wind energy, which is your physical body, but a subtler level that's inextricably linked to your different states of mind. So she can feel the berserkness of this particular wind which relates to anger, or the berserkness of your wind that relates to attachment. And then they can even, because they've got the whole Buddhist model of the mind, they can even link it to your past karma. So it's a holy, I mean, it's a literally a holistic view, the, the Tibetan medical one, based on past karma. They can even see the karma you created. They can see the type of mind by just feeling your different levels of your body, you know, the subtle energies. So that all minds are linked inextricably to their own set of the four elements. So I just find this helpful to posit the possibility that all minds, including animals, there are spirits, there are very intensely suffering beings, there are hell beings, there are the gods, all these beings, are two things, there's the certain level of mental experience and in the, in, the, in the spectrum of these six realms, it's all the way from the blissful states of, bli, of blissful states of what they call the God realms, which are the fruit of virtuous karma, that the experiences, the mental experiences are of joy and bliss and the, and the level of the physical energy there is like subtle light. Then further, you've got a couple of those, that's called God realms. Then you've got the human realm which is said to be, you know, a garbage dump in comparison with the states of bliss in those states of being, but it's the better one because you're not so caught up in thinking everything's so hunky-dory and you've got suffering still, so you can use your intelligence to get the hell out of this mess. So you've got access to your virtue. And clearly our minds are conjoined with a bag of bones here. Look at it, you know. Then you've got the animals. There's an awful lot of them, we can see all the mosquitoes. Our bodies are pervaded by these beings. Under our arm is like a zoo. Apparently our faces have got nice fat paws, so all the creatures love all their paws. Our mouth is like a zoo. I mean, we're disgusting, actually. <laughs> but we think we're so clean and nice, you know. We're pervaded by beings. This is the, the animal realm, not to mention the trillions of fish. Under the, I remember reading 20 years ago on the science pages in the New York Times, the Tuesday one, I think it's still the same. You know, I read on my iPad now. But I remember reading that then they were discovering billions of new species of beings in the depth of the ocean, in the depth of darkness, where there's no oxygen, where they assumed there couldn't be living beings. And this is most interesting, telling you that in the Buddhist teachings they talk about the vast majority of all animals on this planet are the depth of the ocean and the depth of darkness piled high on each other with just the depth of ignorant darkness. There's not, Buddha would say there's not an atom of space you won't find sentient beings. And if you think of this model of the four elements, you could argue that the universe is the four elements. It must be a conducive environment for the existence of sentient beings there. So you've got the gods, like the top end, best suburbs, bliss. The humans, not so blissful, but still better than nothing. And some intelligence, luckily. Then you've got the animals. Well, poor animals. All the creatures, all the fish, all the worms, all the slugs, all the dogs, all the kangaroos, you know. You know, leopard can't change its spots. We say that. So the, the intensity of the suffering of animals. I always remember some time, one years ago, Lama Zopa saying, this is shocking to our minds. It's not how we think at all. But if we just for a few moments could have a direct experience of the, of the intensity of the mental suffering of our little doggy woggy, the suffering would be so unbearable we would never want to waste another second of this precious human life. We'd never want to sleep another moment to waste this precious human life. The suffering would be so intense. That's a shock to us. We don't think dogs are suffering at all. It's mental, the mental state of primordial ignorance, the same ignorance that we have got, which is fear. Then you've got further down the spectrum what they call spirits. Often in the text they're called hungry ghosts. They're real living sentient beings. And you could argue that their minds are conjoined with air energy. They flit from pillar to post. They invade people and animals. 
They live in houses, they haunt houses, because their attachment is the main energy there. The animal is the main, of the three root delusions in the Buddhist model of the mind, which refers to all sentient beings, the ignorance, the primordial ego grasping, and the, the gross ignorance that comes as a manifestation of that is the predominant energy of the animals. The spirits is a predominant energy of profound grasping, intense, unbelievable, unbelievable grasping and attachment. And then you've got the, the lowest suburbs in samsara, and this is called the hell realms. I mean, many Buddhists are embarrassed to talk about this. I find it interesting that over the centuries, this is why I never like to be rude about any religion, I have great respect for these great beings who start to observe things, you know, that don't, you just can't see with your eyes. They all talk about the hells. Look at Mr. Dante, you know, and the Catholics and the Muslims, they all talk about this. But they have different interpretations, it seems to me, of what it is and where, how you get there, you know. So the Buddha's view is, they're all states of mind. They're all beings pervading universes, all with certain states of mind, but come along with a certain level of physicality. And all of those experiences are due to their past actions. They're not created. The massive biggest point for the Buddha, it's not a dualistic view of creation. Nobody's up there pulling the strings, running the show, punishing and rewarding, which is the typical view we have. Buddha completely disagrees with that. He says it's not like that. Or we don't need creating. It's an unnecessary embellishment. We, the tragedy is, the view of karma, the tragedy, until we get hold of it, is that every one of us is experiencing the fruits of our own past actions. I remember Lama Yeshi saying one time, hell is not some place where the devil is waiting, saying, ha ha, I'm waiting for Lama Yeshi. <laughs> no, it's the manifestation of the negative energy of that suffering sentient being. So that's the tragedy of karma. Even though we've created it all ourselves, we really don't realize we are the boss. We are the creator of this universe. We are the creator of all our experiences. That's what's so intense. And that takes time to take on board because it means accountability. It means no blame, no punishment, no reward, no guilt, no shame, just accountability, grown up, accountability, you know, on the case, in charge, I'm finally the boss. This takes time because it's the opposite to how we think. The irony, the terrible suffering irony of ego is that we feel like innocent victims. We believe it totally and our scientific view reinforces it. You didn't ask to get born, did you? This person, this wacko mother and father decide to have a baby. They make you and then chuck you out and then they tell you later that you're responsible. I mean, how dare they? I don't, you don't go to your therapist. If your therapist tells you you come from your mother and father and tell, then tells you you should grow up and start taking responsibility, she's wrong. Sue your parents to the hilt, please. How dare, and I mean this, I know it sounds hilarious, but how dare two idiot people make another version, call them me, and then chuck me out and blame me. I mean, this is, this is not worse than Frankenstein making his monster. How dare they? That's why I find it the wackiest idea in the whole world that your parents make you. It's like hilarious to me now. Do you get my point, people? Buddha says you made yourself, Rabina. Your mummy and daddy were just lying there having fun and you come blasting in, you know? <laughs> Don't blame them. You get your mother and father you deserve. It's okay. Anyway, all these billions and trillions of countless sentient beings, all experiences, as Lama Zopa puts it, their own karmic appearances, their own mental states, their own nightmares or their own happiness, coming along with a certain level of physicality. This is the universe, Buddha says. So the fundamental starting point is establish that you're sick of suffering. Establish that you're sick of suffering. But then you've got to define what suffering is. You've got to know the four noble truths. Well, the first kind of noble, the first noble truth is there is suffering. And Buddha lists three kinds. And this is very depressing. But even the first kind is the obvious one. It's called the suffering of suffering. It's like in your face suffering. It's basically when the bad things happen. This we can get. Everybody agrees that's suffering. And all Buddha's saying is, you know, there are causes of it. That's number two, the second noble truth. And there are two causes. He says two main causes. And it's not the other person. It's not the event. It's not your mother. It's not your father. It's not God. It's not the Catholic nuns. It's not the rapists. It's not the murderer. No, he says. They're only the secondary cause. The main cause, Rabina, is karma, your past action, and your delusion, honey, that informed it. So then, you know, there's no blame. Just take responsibility. Oops, a daisy, you know. And then you realize I'm sick of this suffering, so now you know the cause, and that means you're not gonna do any more of the same. You're gonna stop sowing those seeds. You don't want any more weeds, thank you very much. 
That's the first implication of karma. Pull yourself together and stop killing, stop lying, stop stealing, stop bad mouthing, because that's the cause of the present suffering you've got. You know you don't want further of it, so quit sowing the seeds. And then you really put yourself together, and then at the end of the day, as Lama Zopa says, we're insane not to do it every day. This practice that they call the four opponent powers, the four R's, you purify it. So the first level of practice is because you're sick of suffering, and we're talking the first level only. You don't want the bad things to happen because we're fed up, up to here with suffering. Then I'll stop creating the cause. It's like you get a bellyache every day. You can't keep, you know, you get cancer. You can't keep, you know, suing Marlboro. You've got to stop smoking. You've got to take action. Same here. You know yourself. Just check your life. Do you like being bad-mouthed, harmed by others, cheated on, insulted, hurt, offended, stolen from? We know we don't. We know that's what co called suffering is called suffering. Simple level of suffering. It's obvious. Nobody likes it. Well, Buddha says, I understand, Rabina, darling. So here's the method for you. It's like you go to the homeopathic section in the health shop. You look up the little book. It gives you the med gives you the disease and then gives you the medicine. So the disease is you want to be killed? No. Well then. Solution, stop killing, Rabina. You want to be not lied to? You want to lie to? No, stop lying, stop stealing. A few little simple lists, basic principles, basic actions. Actions that you refrain from doing and that means you will stop the causes, stop the causes that will bring the results you don't want. Suffering. Because this takes time to think because who would think that the killing that happens to you now, the harming, the bad mouthing, all this is from past actions. We don't think this. We either think it's bad luck or it's God's plan, you know, either way. The Buddha says, no, you're the referee. So it takes time to think about it, to take it on board as your hypothesis. It takes courage because the instinct of ego is to blame. We can't help it. Very deep inside us. So the second kind of suffering is very depressing. Buddha calls it the suffering of change, which is a really kind of rather innocuous title. But what he's referring to very depressing, is what we call happiness. So the, only, the context in which to understand this clearly is, is Buddha's understanding of the way the mind works. The three main delusions, in this hierarchy of delusions, this hierarchy of these neuroses that Buddha says are adventitious that you can get rid of, the root one is this ego grasping, it's called, this primordial, which we'll talk about, primordial, deeply primordial, instinctive, wrong, fear-based, panic-stricken sense of a poor little lonely, bereft, fractured me, me, me. This rise is like a lion, a sleeping lion, every time someone hurts you, insults you, offends you. And then it's panic-stricken main voices to get what it wants, which is called attachment. And the millisecond it doesn't get what it wants, that's called aversion, which rises anger or despair and depression. And these are the essential three main delusions that run the universe. The others are just branches, you know. So this, so the, um, the second kind of suffering is, is from following anger and attachment and harming others. So the result is you get harmed, essentially, called experiences similar to causes like that in the past, which comes from anger mostly and harming others. The second kind of suffering is more nuanced. It's harder to see. It's called the suffering of change. What he means by it is what we call happiness. So the first level of suffering, using this as our context, is when, the, is when attachment doesn't get what it wants. The bad mouthing, the harming, the hurt, etc. The second kind of suffering is when attachment gets what it wants and that's what we call happiness. And it's really the, it's the hardest one to see. It's like a honey-covered razor blade, like we were talking last night. So ha attachment is a, basically delusions are liars, deceptive, they're freaked out, they're based in fear. In all this model of the mind, all the, the, the delusions in the, one of the, third, the three categories of states of mind, negative, positive, neutral, the negative ones are, are, based, uh, are based, are coming from the ego grasping, the primordial sense of a self. And what's interesting, if you look at the Buddhist model of the mind, there's no... Fear is not given any status as a state of mind. Attachment, anger, jealousy, low self-esteem, they're given particular status and they're defined very clearly. Why fear is not given its own status is because all the delusions are completely in the nature of fear. This is fascinating. It's not stated so explicitly in the Buddhist teachings. But it's interesting, you know the, the Buddha Tara, the female Buddha, is she here somewhere? No. The Buddha Tara, like she's one of the characteristics that she's often said to represent is 
is the fearlessness. They talk, they talk, her name means liberator, and she's often called the liberator from the fears of samsara. That's Buddhist way of talking about the ordinary daily neuroses that we all have, and all the panic attacks, and anxiety, and depression, and low self-esteem, and anger, and rage, and drama. We can all see all those states of mind are completely dripping in fear. It's their nature. And this is where we can see you've got a fairly you know, uncontrolled level of jealousy or attachment or anger, you name it. You just check behind, it's just rampant fear. Fear is the nature of all these delusions. So when you finally uprooted the root delusion, which means realizing emptiness, which we'll talk about, as Lama Zopa says, then there is no fear. This is inconceivable to us in our psychology. This is what Buddha's saying. So simply, don't think of it like it means heaven or anything. Having delusions means what's called fear. They're in their nature fear because they're liars, they're deceptions, they're fantasies that we have been addicted to believing in for countless eons, Buddha says, and we come fully programmed with them. And they make up elaborate, insane stories. So we don't think we have much mental illness until we have to completely off lose the plot and have to go get, you know, get pills and be sent off to a, you know, a place. But the Buddha basically says we're all mentally ill, we're all psychotic, we're all delusional, we're all bipolar, and I'm not being sarcastic. As long as you've got attachment, anger, fear, jealousy, and all the dramas, depending on how strong they are, is what he means by mental illness. It's just a question of degree, you know. This is what Buddha's saying. His view of mental illness is these regular states of mind that we think are normal. I'm not kidding. And that they're in the nature of fear. They're in the nature of torment, disturbing, distressing. We can prove it. You wake up one day and you're relatively not so angry, not so depressed, not so jealous, and you're relatively kind and open and spacious. Is that not to the extent to which you feel relatively not fearful? Of course it is. The more kindness and love, the more peace. It's sort of logical. They talk about the peace of Nirvana, all these words, we just think it's religion, you know? It's talking psychology. Buddha didn't talk Greek for God's sake. He didn't say psychology. We made that up. It's Greek, that's all. It's called the mind nothing else. Buddha doesn't use the word spirit or soul. It's not, that too, he says, is an unnecessary embellishment. It's enough to have a mind. It's just that his view of the mind goes to far more subtle, more nuanced levels, that's all. So all these realms are just manifestations of these minds, that's all, with a certain level of physicality. That's what Buddha's saying. Created by those sentient beings, themselves. That's the tragedy. And the more ignorance there is, the less awareness. And look at us. The more ignorance, the more attachment, the more fear, the more jealousy, the more tunnel vision, the more fear, the more panic, and the, and, and the less awareness. The less delusions, the more virtue, the more wisdom, the more awareness. That's what we have to cultivate. Start with junior school. Back off and stop harming sentient beings and control your body and speech. Then you can get to high school now and start to meditate and learn to know your mind based on Buddha's model and start to unpack and unravel and begin to control, be in control of our mind, which is pretty stunning. Don't hold your breath yet. Then so together, we can start to really begin to unravel and unpack all these delusions and even begin to understand emptiness. And now we can go to compassion wing and now we can really begin to benefit others because we can see others. Because now we know that we are suffering and we're sick of it, the first kind and the second kind. Because the happiness that we have now is just the happiness of the junkie getting what attachment wants. And what it leads to, which is why it's a honey-covered razor blade, eventually we know it'll wear out and collapse and turn into aversion. Because eventually the, you know, the drug will wear out, the delicious cake, the gorgeous body, the lovely person, the nice praise will exhaust itself and it turns into the panic attack again of not having it. So more craving to get more fixes. This is what Buddha means by samsara. It's really subtle. Don't take it, like, think it's so easy. So we have to know our minds. Then you've got a third kind of suffering. It's even more subtle. We can't even posit such a thing. It's called all-pervasive suffering, which is taking from the Buddha's big picture point of view of all the different realms of existence. And basically, being in samsara, as he calls it, is being caught up in these neuroses. So using the analogy of the junkie, which would mean attachment, because effectively attachment is the main cause of all suffering in day-to-day -day life, effectively. So. When attachment doesn't get what it wants, that's the suffering of suffering, that's when the bad things happen. When attachment does get what it wants, that's the second kind of suffering, and that's called the suffering of change, because it eventually turns into the gross one. 
You keep eating cake, which you're convinced will make you happy. It turns into feeling you want to vomit because you're now stuffed. You know? You keep doing the action that you're convinced will make you happy. And the Buddha says, logically, you can prove it. Keep doing that action. Keep eating that cake. Excuse me, being gross here. Keep having that sex with the most divine person in the universe. And I don't mean go to sleep and get excited again. I mean keep having sex. And if it really is the cause of happiness, you'll get happier and happier and happier. The more cake you eat, I mean continuously, not having a break, going to the toilet and going again. No. Continuously eat cake. Continuously have sex with that handsome body. You, in both cases, you'll be, become exhausted and die. <laughs> so it's not the cause of happiness, he says. It's a honey-covered razor blade. It triggers momentarily a brief moment of pleasure. And it's the only way we know how to trigger pleasure. And we'll talk about that. Because pleasure is not attachment. Pleasure is called happiness. And Buddha says we can have bucket loads of that. He just he says we've got the wrong method. The third kind of suffering, then using this analogy, is that you're born in the first place as a junkie, with a junkie's mind, in a body that has to be sustained. And, so, and, the, and you're born into a world that's made of heroin. And just to, to survive, you need to ingest the heroin. That's called all-pervasive suffering. So never mind that one. Oh, I understand. Karmic connections. Okay, what do you mean? So karmic connections just means we do things in groups and we're going to keep bumping into each other again. So you better fix it up now, please, with your ex-hubbies. Because you're going to meet them again. So with karmic connection, I mean, maybe you're meaning something like that when you talk about families. But we're clearly very social beings, you know? And every millisecond of what we think and do and say, individually and in relation to others, you're, you're creating this history with each other. You know, that mother of yours lying there with your daddy and you just die, Buddha would say, and you've already, the seed that will cause you to go there like a magnet in a few weeks' time is already something before you, even before you stop breathing. Then, you know, you die on autopilot and then the karma's already planned, ready, your own past karma, with intense karmic history with that particular mother and father. Of all the trillions of beings having sex, that's the one you run to. It's like, and what, what runs you towards is attachment. You know, I always quote this, I always remember, I got it recently on my iPad, West Side Story, you know? Maria and Tony at the party, or the, the, jet, the Jets and the, what are they called? The Jets and the uh, Sharks. And at the party, you know, all lovely Jerome, Jerome Robbins' music and dancing, whatever. And then suddenly they see each other and all, everything goes away, doesn't it? It's just Tony and, Tony and Maria. That's karma ripening. That's karmic, karmic connection. They've had co powerful karma in the past. They didn't think of each other a moment before, except Tony did sing that song. What did he say? Something's coming, didn't he? We know it, feel it coming. Bad and good. It's like that. That's karma ripening. You meet a person, instantaneous you fall in love, or instantaneous nightmare. You didn't know they were coming. Karma ripened, that's how they talk, you know. And karma's like petrol you put in the tank. There's a certain amount in there, and then it runs out, or it's, you know, the seed, the, the seed, fruit, the seed and fruit one is a good analogy. Karma ripens, they say. The seed is in there, and, you, and you're moving towards, and three and a half years later, boom, there's Tony. Boom, or there's the, there's the nightmare, there's the rapist, or the murderer, or something, you know. Like that. That's how karma ripens. Karmic connections. So, you know, the same with anything. Your spiritual teachers, your wives, your husband, your mothers, your children, your next door neighbours. Pops up out of nowhere, seemingly, because we're not, we're not clairvoyant. We've got strong history with each other. So I don't know if that answers your point about relatives, but that's a different discussion. He wasn't listening. Sorry. So, sorry. Whoever asked me. Oh, you asked me, didn't you? Yes, yes, question. Of course it is, but you've got to st start with your own first. Is it possible for you to see somebody else's capacity to play music only if you can see your own? So the more wisdom you get about music, you can see the musicians coming, can't you? The more, is it possible to see anything in somebody else's mind? Of course it is, but you've got to know yours first because theirs is the same as yours. That's what wisdom is. Do you see? And that's how you can help people. Yeah. That's how you can help people. Do you understand? Yes. I'm an example of that, and this is... Buddha often says that we can't really begin to benefit people until we're clairvoyant. 
which of course we think is weird and wacko, but for the Buddha, clairvoyance is no big deal. We've had it countless lives before. It's just you accomplish it when you've accessed a more subtle level of mind using these marvelous techniques these Hindus came up with that enables you to then that, that subtle level of mind has the capacity to cognize phenomena that the gross consciousness just can't. That's all, very simple. People have it in their dreams, people have sudden flashes of it, but we can cultivate that in a very clear way. And so there's this lovely story. Our friend Harry was at our monastery, Kopan Monastery in Kathmandu Valley a long time, he told me this story. And Lama Yeshi, our guru, he, Harry would try to, one of the monks living there, all these Sherpa monks, he said he was, this monk was very sick. And Harry had found a doctor to help the monk. So he happened to mention to Lama Yeshi he'd found a doctor. So Lama Yeshi is Harry's guru, and so Harry has confidence in Lama. And Lama just said to Harry, back off and don't do anything. He didn't explain. So Harry had trust in Lama, and he didn't do anything. He didn't get the doctor. The monk got sick. He went to the mountains, to his family, and he died. And that sounds like Lama Yeshi was rather cruel and didn't care, you know. But then Lama Lundup, the abbot of the monastery, explained to Harry what was happening. He said, because of Lama's clairvoyance, and we have to deduce that's a possibility, okay, this level of wisdom these great yogis have got, plus, of course, infinite compassion, means in compassion as well as wisdom. He could see the karma that this monk had created. That he could, by getting a doctor now, he would have got better, which means he would have had a fine life. But the karma was particularly heavy, and he wouldn't have finished that karma. So next life would have been a nightmare. Whereas by dying now, Lama could see that would purify that karma and he in fact died very peacefully. He would die and then finish the karma, next life fantastic. Now I mean who's got, who's got that kind of wisdom, you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, but that's what we're capable of and as Buddha says we can't really begin to understand beings and help them until you've got clairvoyance, it's obvious. Because you have to see their minds and know what is truly best. It's not an easy one, but we do the best we can with whatever wisdom we have got. Do you understand? Yes. It's a huge one. As, Ho as Holiness often says, compassion is not enough. You've got to have wisdom. So compassion, we'll, we'll talk more about this, is this incredible empathy with the suffering of others and the wish to help. But that's not what makes you know how to help. That's what you get from wisdom, which is what you get when you work your own mind out and understand karma, understand your mind and get some clarity. Then you can know yourself well and know what causes your suffering and now you can see the person well and know what causes them suffering and be a wise helper. This is a powerful one. So the, key, the point, Dan's point about humans, you know, the Buddhist findings about the mind, first of all, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the Buddhist model of the mind covers all sentient beings, which is kind of surprising. I mean, well, it's not surprising, we just don't think of it this way, because we don't talk about anything but humans, you know. It includes all the animals, all the spirits, all the hell beings, all the gods. This view of the mind the Buddha has is the fundamental thing that runs the universe of all sentient beings. And all sentient beings are acting out different levels of these states of mind. The humans are the ones who have got some access to some virtue, the Buddha would say. That's the nature of what a human mind is. If we're lucky, we can access that virtue. But look at most humans, this is a total tragedy. Due to past virtue, their track of karma called the fully ripened result got them into a human womb, but then not much good tendencies, not in some, maybe some good experiences, but not much awareness. And as Amazopa says, and this is a tragedy, the vast majority of all humans on this earth have absolutely no idea that what goes on in their mind plays any role at all in their lives. This is the worst of our suffering of unawareness. This is the tragedy of our suffering, you know. So to be, so, yeah. So this model refers to all sentient beings. This is why it's fundamental, fundamental to know your mind, but also to mix it with understanding karma because this is, this is what, this is what explains to us why I am who I am, why I get these experiences. In other words, it's Buddha's explanation of the, of the question, why me? The biggest question we all ask, the biggest suffering we have because we haven't got an answer is to the one to why me, or why does this happen, or why is there suffering, or why Hitler, or why the poor Tibetans, or why whatever the thing might be. We look out in the world and the scientific model has no explanation. Christians have one, Muslims have one, Jews have one, that's fine. But the Buddha's got his own too, and the view is karma. So for me, the application of the view of karma 
The application of the view of karma is using that as my model, my working hypothesis, to explain why good and bad things happen to me and everyone else, which calms down the panic. At least it's an explanation you're using to inform your choices, which is why then too, as I mentioned yesterday, that helps in the compassion wing too. Those young Tibetan nuns who were invited by Richard Gere that time I said 2003, a whole bunch of His Holiness came, he invited 20 former prisoners and a bunch of people like me who worked with people in prison. And these 20 people in prison had all done some kind of meditation. They met His Holiness, it was a very wonderful meeting. And then they'd also, he invited two young Tibetan nuns who described their experience of being sexually abused and tortured in prison in Tibet. And they were very sweet, talking about their experiences. They were quiet, very humble, and they were in tears, naturally, because they were very sad. But the point was, I think, it was very shocking to the Westerners. They weren't angry. And we could spend the rest of the two days talking about this. If you analyze the assumptions behind anger, and that's what Buddha is demanding we do, analyze the assumptions behind all our thoughts and the feelings and emotions, look into what we assume to be true, and the assumption of anger is innocent victim. The assumption, and that's an absolute scientific truth for us in our culture, which is why we have such fierce anger. Because we're all innocent, no one asked to get born. I don't deserve it, it's the strongest feeling we have. So they, these young women, brought up with the view of karma. That view is in the bones of their being, just like for us the innocent victim is the bones of our, in the bones of our being, which is why we have so much attachment and greed and, a, and anger and depression. So they, 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 they were in tears, sad but not angry. And then they said, quietly, humbly, and of course we had compassion for our torturers because we knew we must have harmed them in the past. So this is one of a karmic connection. There's not a millisecond of any sentient being we meet and there's not a millisecond of any action they do to us, good or bad, that we didn't cause. This is such a simple concept, you know? In other words, if you think of your life like your garden, you know by definition it's being your garden means whatever is in it, you put it there. You don't go, who put this weed in my garden? It's your weed in your garden. So when you can own the roses and own the veggies and own the beautiful things, it's easy to own the weeds too. But the tragedy is we only think about karma when it comes to the weeds. Why do bad things happen, you know? But it covers all the good stuff, the Buddha would say, naturally. So the view of karma is massive. It's not just some extra little weird bell and whistle that you add on if you want. Without the view of karma, Buddha's view of the universe collapses into a heap of total idiocy. Really, in the way Buddha presents it, you know. Many people don't even think it's really Buddha's teaching. It's kind of fascinating. It's all in all the texts, you look back at all the sources, you know. So it's time for lunch. 12.33. So, uh, we're going to have lunch here, aren't we? Yes. Fantastic. So can we think of lunch differently? Buddha wants us to think of everything differently have a different take on things. So let's think of lunch, uh, <coughs> let's think of it as the handiwork of hardworking sentient beings, which indeed it is. But first of all, when we think of lunch, we tend to have attachment in the mind that dri drives us towards lunch, the wish for food. And then immediately what we're gonna see is in, through the filter of our attachment. So the extent to which the food is gonna fulfill my attachment is the extent to which I'm gonna feel all perky. And the extent to which the food is not what my attachment wants is the extent to which we think, oh, we mightn't be rude about it, we might eat it politely. So we usually see everything through the filter of attachment. So instead we think it's the handiwork of sentient beings, how kind they are to make this food that I can't stand. Most generous of them. And we'll eat it with a happy mind, or not, and wish to get fat and healthy so we can keep on listening to the teachings and working on our minds and benefiting sentient beings. Thinking like this.